Abnormal lung opacities are usually the cause of one of these four processes. In this talk, we're going to be discussing interstitial opacities. We can divide interstitial opacities into septal interstitial opacities, reticular interstitial opacities, non-calcified nodular interstitial opacities, and part-calcified nodular interstitial opacities. We can usually tell these four um, interstitial patterns apart from each other when they happen um, on CT imaging. However, on chest x-ray, because of the superimposition of anatomy from three dimensions into, into just two, um, and the more kind of limited ability to resolve um, different attenuations, um, it's a little bit more challenging to recognize the differences between these four morphologic patterns of interstitial um, opacities. For starters, um, it's very difficult to tell the difference between a non-calcified nodular and a part-calcified nodular interstitial pattern on chest x-ray. They're going to look pretty much identical. Um, the septal interstitial pattern um, is not visible um, usually on a chest x-ray, at least not the way we would imagine. Um, all of these uh, thickened uh, one to two centimeter polygons, um, when you um, collapse them from three dimensions into two, um, you no longer see um, each of the individual polygon edges anymore. Um, however, um, along the margins of the lung, when the photon doesn't have to go through so many uh, layers of different lobules, uh, you might still make out a few of these kind of linear um, opacities um, right along the edge of the lung. Um, these are uh, called not septal interstitial opacities on a chest x-ray, but we refer to those as curly B lines. And uh, as we go further into the next interstitial um, opacity talk, we'll explain how this happens. Um, on chest x-ray though, uh, reticular interstitial opacities are still um, they still have a similar appearance to what you'd expect. Um, and they're usually recognizable as such. So um, practically speaking, um, the four um, different interstitial opacity patterns that exist and that are discernible from each other on CT imaging um, kind of collapse into three um, interstitial patterns on chest x-ray. Um, curly B lines, basically a representation of septal interstitial opacities, reticular interstitial pattern, and then a nodular interstitial pattern, um, which uh, may or may not be uh, calc uh, part calcified. Um, due to the nature of um, you know, um, imaging um, on x-rays, um, sometimes we may not even be able to uh, discern if something's reticular or nodular in some cases. And so um, sometimes we'll find ourselves using this term reticulo nodular because we really can't commit to, well, we see an interstitial opacity, but we can't quite commit to whether it's reticular or nodular. So um, when we're describing uh, interstitial opacities on a chest x-ray, they can be visible. Um, these are the terms we're more likely to use. Um, whereas on CT imaging, um, with the uh, you know, enhanced ability to um, visualize anatomy, uh, we'll be using these four terms. For the purpose of this talk, we're going to be focusing on nodular interstitial um, opacity patterns, um, spending a lot of time on the non-calcified nodular interstitial patterns, and then a little bit of time at the end on the part-calcified nodular interstitial patterns. So let's begin with a discussion on uh, non-calcified nodular interstitial opacities. When you um, look around you or look at different people's reports, um, there's lots of adjectives um, you'll see people use when describing a nodular interstitial pattern on a, uh, in the lungs on a CT scan. And um, to me, it was always a little bit tricky um, to understand as a resident. But, you know, these nine terms are probably the most common terms you'll hear people use when describing uh, nodular interstitial patterns within the lung. Um, they fall into three groups of three. Uh, and we're going to kind of tackle each of these uh, three groups of terms, um, one after each other. Terms like bronchocentric, peribronchovascular, peribronchial in the first column, um, we would actually probably suggest you preserve for using to describe consolidation of masses uh, rather than nodular interstitial patterns. Um, the second column of terms, perilymphatic, centrilobular, and random um, are um, 
primary nodular interstitial patterns that uh, hopefully we're all uh, going to become familiar with. The last column, bronchovascular, tree and bud, and miliary, are also uh, descriptors for um, nodular interstitial patterns, which are um, kind of, uh, the best way I could put it, are derivatives of the primary uh, patterns in the second column. Those first three terms, bronchocentric, peribronchovascular, peribronchial, um, we probably should try our best to reserve for using to describe uh, masses in consolidation rather than uh, nodular interstitial patterns. Um, if you just look at the root words, they all sound very similar at first glance. Um, we know the bronchovascular bundle in the lung is composed of airway and um, vessel, um, using pulmonary artery. And you can imagine that um, something centered upon the airway, bronchocentric, something that's surrounding the bronchovascular bundle, peribronchovascular, and something that's surrounding the airway, peribronchial, all sound the same. Um, it suggests that whatever consolidation or mass you're describing is, uh, you know, kind of related to the bronchovascular bundle, and you'd be right. Um, the only kind of uh, subtle difference that um, I may use um, when applying these terms is not necessarily whether a mass or consolidation is associated with the bronchovascular bundle or not, um, but rather uh, where it is uh, within the lung from a central to peripheral kind of distribution. So if we were to um, divide the lung into uh, a inner, middle, and outer third, like I've done in this image, um, I would apply the term peribronchovascular to describe a mass or consolidation associated with the bronchovascular bundle, whether it's in the central, mid, or outer third of the lung, or perhaps the outer two-thirds or the inner two-thirds. Um, the definition uh, for peribronchovascular is alluded to in uh, the Fleischner Society Glossary of Terms, um, which is the clip I've uh, kind of included here. Um, it specifies in the last sentence, extends from the hyla to the lung periphery. And that's why I would uh, use peribronchovascular to describe anything um, central or peripheral, um, as long as it's hanging around the bronchovascular bundle. Uh, anything meaning a um, you know mass consolidation. Bronchocentric, however, um, I would reserve for describing uh, consolidation or masses that are associated with the bronchovascular bundle, but in the inner two thirds of the lung. Uh, the reason why I would do this is uh, derived from the definition of bronchocentric that appears in the Fleischer Society of, uh, of uh, their glossary of terms. Um, they say uh, for bronchocentric, uh, applied to disease that is conspicuously centered on macroscopic bronchovascular bundles. Um, to me, uh, I interpret this to mean uh, where the airways are visible, at least in their normal state on CT. Um, usually airways are visible in the inner two thirds of a lung under normal conditions and not really perceptible in the outer third, unless there's like pathology like bronchiectasis at play. Um, they actually include an um, image in their paper. Um, there's this um, consolidation that's uh, hanging around the bronchovascular bundle, and you can see it's uh, primarily centered within the inner two thirds of a lung uh, where airway is normal, normally visible. So for me, um, bronchocentric represents a subset, I guess, of uh, peribronchovascular. Uh, peribronchial is a kind of a, uh, probably a, a other term. It doesn't show up within the Fleischer Society glossary, um, but um, for many of us, uh, it's a synonym for bronchocentric. Okay, so I just wanted to spend a few minutes just to discuss those first three terms, but um, I really want to spend most of our time um, focusing on the second and third columns. These are true micronodular um, interstitial patterns. And we're going to start with the primary uh, ones, the perilymphatic, centrilobular, and random nodular interstitial patterns. And to be able to appreciate what these patterns mean and what they are and what the differential diagnoses are requires us to have a basic understanding of the anatomy of the lung. The basic building block um, of a lung or of a lobe of a lung is a structure called the secondary pulmonary lobule. And the secondary pulmonary lobule is this uh, polygonal structure. 
Um, obviously, it has three dimensions. Um, that's about one to two centimeters in size. So these things are not microscopic. Um, they're maybe about the size of a quarter, um, uh, you know, um, in terms of the, the coin. Now, um, this uh, structure we call the secondary pulmonary lobule has a uh, central lobular bronchial or airway in the middle. Um, paired with that airway is a, a pulmonary artery. Um, the pulmonary veins, which drain this lobule, um, are found within the wall of the lobule, uh, drawn here in blue. And then uh, we have lymphatic channels um, that also drain and serve as the sewage system of this lobule. Um, we have periarterial lymphatics, which travel with the pulmonary arteries and drain lymph uh, towards the hilum centrally. And we also have perivenous lymphatics, which parallel the um, pulmonary veins. Um, many of these will drain to the pleural space sometimes. Now, the um, pulmonary arterial branching is relatively predictable. Um, it happens in a relatively uh, radially symmetric sort of way. Um, pulmonary veins are div uh, distributed a little bit more unpredictably and arbitrarily. In this drawing, all I've done is draw an airway, uh, first order airway in a pulmonary artery in the center of this lobule and have all of this black space um, otherwise within the lobule. Um, this represents a simplification um, of what actually happens because as you could imagine, um, there's a second, third, fourth, fifth order, et cetera, um, branches to both the central airway and the pulmonary arteries, um, all in that space that's in black within this polygon. But in order to keep the graphic simple, we're just drawing the first order one in the center of the lobule. Um, these pulmonary lobules will tessellate to form a lobe of lung. And that lung lobe is enveloped within, uh, is enveloped by an airtight membrane uh, we call the visceral pleura. Because every lobule is um, about one to two centimeters in size, the large, largest vessel um, and airway in the middle of each lobule um, should be at most, or at least, um, five millimeters away from any lung margin, unless, I guess, there's atelectasis or, or scarring or something like that. Now, this uh, is a drawing of the lobular, of the lobular anatomy um, of a lobe. Um, from a conceptual standpoint. But if we think about the way this would appear on a real CT scan, um, things are gonna look a little bit different if we draw this picture to scale. Those lymphatic channels that we've drawn in green here, so we can actually see them better on this image, are in a healthy situation gonna to be too small to actually see uh, within the spatial resolution of a CT image. Likewise, the pulmonary veins and the walls of all these lobules uh, in a normal um, state should be also too small to resolve on a CT image. The walls of each of these lobules in a healthy state will be too thin to resolve within the spatial resolution of a CT image. Those central um, lobular bronchioles, those airways, the walls are gonna be too thin um, to perceive in a normal state on a CT image. And those central pulmonary arteries, they're gonna be just at the uh, limits of resolution on a CT image. So that whole structure that we had just drawn in color a few slides ago, if we drew it to scale on a CT image would look like this. And unless there's a pneumothorax, we probably wouldn't see the visceral pleura because it would be just um, adherent to the chest wall with the ribs and soft tissues. It's important for us now to go forward and think about what happens to all this anatomy that we drew uh, when disease occurs. Now, when we talk about um, the types of diseases, just in terms of broad categories that can cause a non-calcified nodular interstitial pattern in the lung, um, there's really five categories of disease. We've got inhalational disorders, 
In this case, we're referring to inhalation of organic matter. Uh, we've got lymphatic disorders. Uh, those can sometimes cause a nodular interstitial pattern in the lung. Hematogenously disseminated disorders can too. Um, vasculitis, um, small vessel, small arterial, basically, inflammation can. And finally, pneumoconiosis can also result in a non-calcified nodular interstitial pattern. Uh, we'll separate the consideration of pneumoconiosis from the first group. Uh, in pneumoconiosis, we're talking about the inhalation of inorganic matter, uh, and usually of a coarser size. So look, we're going to look at how each of these five different disease categories would manifest at the lobular anatomic level and make predictions about how CT imaging would appear. So um, the differential diagnosis for inhalational disorders, when we think of organic matter, um, is right here. So a lot of different types of uh, lung infection, um, probably what I referred to as infectious bronchiolitis most of the time. Uh, possible sources are bacterial, viral, or mycobacterial. And two other diseases, um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, specifically non-fibrotic hypersensitivity uh, pneumonitis, and respiratory bronchiolitis, RB, um, a disease of smokers, can also are also um, uh, within this differential diagnosis of inhalational disorders that can result in a non-calcified nodular interstitial pattern. Um, in the early stages, um, any one of these entities in this list will um, behave similarly. <clears throat> What's going to happen is um, you're going to inhale this, um, whether it's uh, viral particles or um, you know mold or what have you. And what's going to happen first is um, this is going to get into those um, central airways uh, within the um, lobules. And the innate immune response is going to occur. And what's going to occur most likely is you're going to encounter um, thickening of the wall of these central airways and perhaps um, fluid accumulate within the lumen of those airways. So what was previously a small, thin-walled, hollow airway may become something that's larger uh, because the walls thicken, it's filled with fluid, and it's now become slightly distended. Um, so much so that um, it's going to be substantially larger than it would have been in its normal state. Um, at this stage of, uh, at early stages of, uh, you know, these processes, whether we're talking about um, these infectious bronchiolitis or um, or HP or RB, um, this is not going to be a disease that's going to inf uh, involve the pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary veins, or even the lymphatics yet. Um, so those will just look normal. Um, same thing with those lymphatics. So if we were to draw this picture to scale, this is what we would expect to see. The pulmonary veins are still too small to see. The septal, the walls of the lobules are too thin to see. The pulmonary arteries are just barely visible. And the lymphatics are too small to see too. But now uh, we're in a situation where those uh, lobular airways are larger and perhaps visible now. Now, um, because there's an inflammatory kind of um, event occurring at each of these sites, um, it's not unusual to see a little bit of a ground glass halo as inflammation begins to spill over into the immediate vicinity of these airways. And these airways are relatively equidistant from each other because the size of each of these pulmonary lobules is about the same. Um, and so these dots will all be spaced relatively equidistant from each other. So there, there's a, an element of symmetry involved. And we would not expect um, these dots. Sometimes they look a little fuzzy because of the ground glass kind of margin surrounding them. Um, we would not expect these to touch the margin of the lung because the center of the lobule is at least usually five millimeters away from um, the nearest uh, lobular wall. You may see this play out maybe not only in the first, but your second order um, airways. And you may um, kind of see these um, kind of uh, dots with their kind of indistinct margin because of the little ground glass around them um, that look like little rosettes. Um, they may look something like this. Um, so you see first and second order airways. If some of the first order airways were to clear out a little bit, maybe you'd see a pattern like this, 
or a pattern like this. And so um, the kind of imaging pattern we predict we'd see on CT imaging for um, any of these inhalational disorders of fine organic matter um, would be best described as, you know, tiny um, nodules that are probably a little fuzzy, um, that are relatively equidistant from each other and not touching the edge of the lung. And if you look at a, a real CT image of such, of such a phenomenon, um, that's exactly what we see. Uh, so faint, fuzzy uh, little dots, none of which touch the pleura, um, in a relatively evenly spaced distribution. So there's some symmetry. So I'm thinking of like the pattern, um, for example, in a person's dress. Um, and uh, we'll talk about pulmonary artery studying and geographic distribution a little bit later, but I'm going to leave those um, two rows um, unaddressed for now. All right, so that's how um, the first group of um, disease would change the lobular anatomy of the lung and what kind of a prediction we would make and be able to confirm um, on, on CT imaging. When it comes to lymphatic disorders, um, sarcoidosis and lymphangitic carcinomatosis are the two entities I'd think of um, that would be responsible for a nodular interstitial uh, pattern in the lung. In this case, uh, this is not an airway problem. This is not a pulmonary arterial problem or a pulmonary venous problem. So all of those should um, appear as small or imperceptible as they would normally on a CT scan. But something is going to happen within the lymphatics. Um, whether it's sarcoid or lymphangitic tumor, we're going to start seeing clumps of cells or material um, clog up you know, different parts of these lymphatic channels. And everywhere there's a clump, you're gonna see a dot. So anywhere we see a periarterial lymphatic is a possible opportunity for a dot to form. Anywhere we see a perivenous lymphatic is an opportunity for a dot to appear. And so um, maybe something like this would, would occur. Um, so anywhere there's a potential um, chance for a dot to, or a clump to form uh, might be a dot. Um, there's not going to be a the type of inflammatory um, change in the immediate um, kind of vicinity of one of these dots. So these tend to be sharply marginated, um, not faint, fuzzy um, dots like we saw with the first category of diseases. And because um, some of these um, perivenous lymphatics are along the edge of a lobule, they will some of them will touch or quote unquote stud the pleural surface. Um, either along the edges of a lung or along a fissure. The distribution of these dots is going to appear more haphazard and not quite as ordered as with the first category of diseases, just because the pulmonary venous anatomy is more arbitrary and the pulmonary, the perivenous lymphatics are therefore also somewhat arbitrary in distribution. So this is the dot pattern we'd expect to see. Now, something interesting happens in that um, if you clog up enough of these lymphatic channels, you start interfering with the ability of um, the lymphatic system to, to drain lymphatic fluid away from each of these lobules. If that happens, um, the actual um, walls of the lobule may become boggy and thickened. And so you might see a pattern that looks even like this. Well, that's only if you've you know, impaired the lymphatic flow enough. And so it's very often you won't see that and you'll just see the dot pattern itself. So we would predict that um, diseases like sarcoidosis and lymphogenic carcinomatosis would result in a dot pattern that looked like this. And if we look at some real examples, um, example CT images, um, this bears out. So we're looking at um, solid, dense, sharp nodules, not fuzzy, faint ones, um, some of which touch pleura. Some of them are going to stud the pulmonary artery. What do we mean? Um, that basically means that along a course of pulmonary artery, you may see little dots that look like they're just on the surface, like chicken pox, um, because you got a, a kind of a run of pulmonary artery and the periarterial lymphatic travels parallels right next to it. And every time a little clump forms, it will look like a dot on the surface of that pulmonary artery. The pattern of these dots is going to be more, for lack of a better word, I'll call it clicky. Um, think about how high school students might sit in the um, cafeteria. You might get groups and a few loners, um, but you're not going to see 
the same kind of equidistant um, kind of distribution as with um, the organic inhalational disorders. All right, moving on. Hematogenous disseminated disorders can cause a nodular interstitial pattern. Uh, we're referring in this case to the hematogenous dissemination of fine metastases. Um, thyroid cancer, breast cancer, renal cancer are the first three that would be on my list. Um, hematogenous disseminated tuberculosis and endemic fungal infections. This ends up being a disease not of the airway, but a disease that's going to involve, first and foremost, the pulmonary arteries, because that's um, what's going to be trapping, if you will, these, um, whether it's uh, tumor particles or, or TV particles, what have you. And anywhere um, one of these particles gets trapped by the um, pulmonary arterial system as it gets narrower and narrower as, it, as we go from first to second to third order branches, um, you, is a possibility for a clump to form. Um, and what's interesting is, is obviously um, these dots can occur anytime, like, you know, say you catch a clump of uh, tumor or TB uh, in the central uh, first order pulmonary artery, but smaller particles might be trapped in a second, third, fourth order pulmonary artery, um, somewhere in that black expanse on these um, drawings here. And so those are also possible spots for a dot to form. Now diseases like um, malignancy or tuberculosis, um, these are not going to be short-term acute uh, processes. And so invariably, um, these tumor particles or these um, TB particles, what have you, are going to be swept up within the sewage system of these lobules that we call the lymphatics. And so these will eventually find their way into the lymphatics and potentially, you know, form clumps within the lymphatic channels as well. So you might see uh, dots everywhere there's a lymphatic channel. And so if we were to kind of predict how we would expect uh, the CT of lung um, to look in the setting of sarcoid or tuberculosis or, or, or you know, hematogenous disseminated uh, um, fine mets. This is the pattern we would expect to see. And that's what plays out. Um, here's an example of a patient with disseminated histoplasmosis. So we um, expect to see sharp, dense um, dots everywhere. Um, but one thing's kind of interesting is that, you know, the distribution of these guys is going to be probably a lot more uniform and diffuse throughout the lungs um, than for any of the other diseases we've seen so far. Um, if you're going to throw hundreds, not thousands of particles um, into the bloodstream and have the lung filter them out, unless, unless there's a PE, um, you know, you would expect to be um, that they'd kind of go everywhere. Uh, and be, just be distributed relatively uniformly, as opposed to you know involving some areas and spearing other uh, regions too. Now, um, folks will often say, "Hey, weren't the last two patterns we saw for lymphatic and for hematogenous disseminated um, processes the same?" Well, they're very similar. Um, this is the um, the drawing we proposed um, for lymphatic, uh, lymphatic disorders. And this is the drawing we proposed for hematogenously disseminated disorders. So they look very similar. Certainly, certainly look different from the first one, but they look similar to each other. Um, CTs, um, the image on the left is a lymphatic um, disorder um, causing uh, a nodular interstitial pattern. The image on the right is a hematogenously, hematogenously disseminated process um, presenting as a nodular interstitial pattern. So what's the difference here? There is a subtle difference. Um, the hematogenously disseminated nodular interstitial pattern, the dots are actually a little bit more um, spread out uniformly, um, less clicky, if you will. Um, this is more. This is probably more similar to the way stars look like when you look at the sky at night than in the image on the left with lymphatic disorders. Um, in that case, there's a lot, lot more clustering and, and, and uh, clickiness to how the nodules are distributed. Moving on. Small vessel vasculitis is another cause of a non-calcified nodular interstitial pattern. This is a disease of the pulmonary arteries. And anywhere one of these tiny pulmonary arteries were to become inflamed and possibly leak, 
could be the source of a fuzzy little dot. And so um, we would expect or predict that um, this is the kind of pattern we'd see. This is not a disease of the pulmonary veins or the lymphatics or the airways. So all those structures should still remain below the this, this spatial resolution of CT and invisible. And so this is how we'd predict vasculitis to look. And maybe you might get a few second order pulmonary arteries um, involved and develop a pattern that can look like this, um, or look like this, or look like this, if only some of them were involved. And that's um, how, we, how we, you know, we would expect um, vasculitis to play out if presenting as a nodular interstitial process. Fuzzier dots, um, you know, as, the, as a blush of blood around each of these vessels, relatively evenly spaced. Um, and this is what, you know, um, you know we observe um, in the setting of, um, you know, earlier stage um, uh, vasculitis. Now, obviously, if it were to become more severe, um, you'd start just seeing widespread um, airspace filling, uh, ground glass opacities, consolidation. Um, but in an earlier state, um, this is what we would expect to see. Our last group of uh, diseases that can cause uh, a non-calcified nodular interstitial pattern are pneumoconioses, when people inhale coarse inorganic particles like silica or coal, for example. In that case, um, what you're going to see is um, you're going to introduce these into the airways. So I might expect to see perhaps an immune, uh, innate immune response uh, causing some thickening of those um, airway walls, some fluid to form that might distend them and make them bigger but you're not gonna be able to kill these. Um, these are not really organisms to be killed. Um, these particles are gonna stay around and eventually end up within the lymphatic system, the, again, the sewage system of the lobules. And uh, the body will do its thing when it sees a foreign object like this and try to wall it off. And perhaps uh, you'll see a little um, kind of uh, position of collagen and stuff around each of these particles that may become big enough to form a dot. And so, our prediction for pneumoconiosis would be um, those airways which are normally invisible um, may become visible um, as they're full of fluid and walls are thickened. And there's a possibility of um, clumps, little dots to form uh, anywhere there's a lymphatic channel, periarterial or perivenous. And so we would predict uh, a pneumoconiosis like silicosis or co-workers pneumoconiosis to look like this um, on a CT scan which is um, indeed what we kind of see in this example here. So uh, sh um, dense, sharp dots, they tend to cluster, um, and sometimes we'll touch the pleura. So um, with a basic understanding of the pathophysiology of these five categories of diseases, uh, we've been able to make a relatively educated predictions of what the nodular interstitial pattern would look like for each of these five processes. Um, you'll notice though that we really only drew three diagrams because it turns out that um, some of these are exactly the same. So even though we've um, drawn five diagrams, there's really only been three um, 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 patterns we've kind of come up with. Um, one that we um, observed in the setting of organic uh, inhalational diseases and small vessel vasculitis. One pattern that we drew uh, in the setting of lymphatic, lymphatic diseases and pneumoconioses, and one pattern we drew for um, hematogenously disseminated disease. Um, it turns out that these three patterns have names. Uh, we don't call them pattern A, pattern B, pattern C. Uh, we call these the century lobular pattern for the first one. We call the second pattern paralymphatic and we refer to the third pattern as a random uh, pattern or a random interstitial pattern. So um, just to recap, so this is a century lobular nodular interstitial pattern. This is a paralymphatic one, and this is a random one. Uh, what that means is that uh, when we encounter these imaging patterns on a CT, uh, we can actually offer a differential diagnosis. If I see a pattern we describe as a century lobular nodular interstitial pattern, I'm going to be guessing, could this be some sort of um, small airways infection? Could this be HP? Could it be RB? Could it be a small vessel vasculitis? If I see a perilymphatic pattern on a CT image, could it be 
sarcoidosis, lymphangitic carcinomatosis, or pneumoconiosis. And if I encounter a random pattern, um, I'm thinking of disseminated METS, TB, or an endemic fungal infection. So this hopefully ties together um, basically um, what is happening um, to cause these three primary nodular interstitial patterns we're all asked to learn as residents. Um, so you kind of understand the cause and the effect um, and why the differential diagnoses are the way they are. Now, let's say, um, you know, you take this knowledge into the reading room and you see a CT like this one. Um, I see little nodular opacities, kind of groups here. Um, this is a, you know, a nodular interstitial pattern that we're seeing. Um, we'd ask ourselves, well, now that we've mastered centrolobular, paralymphatic, and random nodule interstitial patterns, um, is this a centrolobular pattern we're looking at? Um, here are some of the basic characteristics of a centrolobular pattern. Well, they're not exactly indistinct faint nodules. With, you know, they're kind of relatively well-defined. And there's a lot of clustering here. Um, they don't really kind of, not really equidistant, although they, they don't touch the plural margins, but, you know... This doesn't seem like a centrolobular pattern. All right. What if, what if it's a paralymphatic pattern? Well, paralymphatic patterns are, you know, uh, denser nodules, which these are, and they cluster and clump, which these sort of do, but they also touch the lung, the pleural margins, which these really don't. So, hmm, not a paralymphatic pattern. Um, okay, if it's not centrolobular and paralymphatic, it's gotta be random, right? Um, well, uh, so these are the features that we'd expect of a random um, nodule interstitial pattern, but there's a few things that aren't quite right. Um, this is really kind of um, uh, sparing areas of lung and involving other areas. If this were truly a hematogenously disseminated process, the distribution should be really uniform um, throughout the entire lung on this image. So this thing is not central lobular, not paralymphatic, and not random. Hmm. Um, well, we get the answer later, it's endobronchial TB. Well, that's interesting. So something's not quite right here, huh? Let's take another um, image. Let's say uh, the next CT you pull up looks like this. You go through the same exercise. You ask yourself, could this thing be a central lobular um, nodular interstitial pattern? And your answer is no. Could it be paralymphatic? Um, no. Um, is this thing random? Also, no. Um, hmm. uh, this one is actually a case of sarcoid. So what's wrong? Well, what's wrong here is uh, we haven't finished the conversation. Um, there's more than these three primary um, nodular interstitial patterns that can exist in real life. There's a few other ones. Um, and those are the ones in this third column we'll have to learn about. These are patterns that are effectively derivatives of the first three primary patterns we've been discussing. Let's talk about central lobular pattern again. Um, we uh, kind of covered the differential diagnosis for a central lobular nodular interstitial pattern. Something's interesting that happens um, with the infections on this um, list. With infections that present um, as a central lobular pattern, um, over time, that pattern evolves. So what starts out like this may change as the fluid within those airways continues to accumulate and eventually um, work themselves upstream to connect with each other. And perhaps eventually the early kind of inflammation um, around those um, airways starts dissipating and you end up with something like this, something that looks like jacks or what some folks believe looks like a tree in bud. And that's an example of one on a CT image. So we refer to this pattern, um, a derivative, if you will, of a central lobular pattern in the setting of uh, infections as a tree and bud pattern. So central lobular pattern on the left, tree and bud pattern on the right. Um, differences are this tree and bud pattern, um, the dots now appear more dense um, than in a central lobular pattern. Um, clickiness, um, just because we're starting to see um, little tiny um, mucus plugs start connecting some of these dots with each other. Um, and in this case, they're usually never, they're very rarely symmetrically diffuse.
um, maybe never is too strong a word, but they're rarely symmetrically diffuse. Um, because this is usually a disease we see with um, infections, uh, not with a diffuser processes like RB. Um, so here's a kind of a short list of the characteristics of a tree and bud pattern. So um, when you see a tree and bud pattern, um, what's a differential diagnosis? Well, it's just a subset of the central lobular pattern differential, um, but just the infectious um, agents um, on that list. Let's move on now to talk about that perilymphatic pattern we were talking about earlier. Um, these are the causes. Um, this is the dot pattern we predicted. Um, I've drawn in red here, the pulmonary arteries. And for the sake of our conversation for the next uh, slide or two, I'm gonna draw in the pulmonary veins. So what you see here are dots um, in both periarterial and perivenous lymphatics. Now, just imagine um, if in your particular case of sarcoid or pneumoconiosis or lymphangitic carcinomatosis, there was relative sparing of the perivenous lymphatics. Um, that sometimes can occur. We don't always know why, but if it occurs, you'd expect to see much fewer dots form within the perivenous lymphatics, which happen to be the ones that are along the margins of the lobules. And whatever dots would form would be more uh, preferentially just, um, kind of distributed towards the ones that are next to the pulmonary arteries. So in cases where um, the perilymphatic pattern was playing out, but for whatever reason, there is relative spearing of the perivenous lymphatics, which drain primarily to the pleura. And so you're dealing with a situation where you're seeing mostly drainage uh, involvement of lymphatics that are draining centrally. This is the pattern you'd expect to see. And it looks different um, than the ones that we've come before. And so therefore we give it a name. Uh, we'll refer to it as, as a bronchovascular nodular interstitial pattern. And it looks like this. Um, in a sense, it's a perilymphatic pattern without the pleural study. So let's compare the two. Um, on the left is a perilymphatic example. On the right is a bronchovascular nodular interstitial pattern example. Um, when we encounter a bronchovascular nodular interstitial pattern, um, we're going to give the same uh, differential diagnosis as we would have given for a perilymphatic pattern. Because this can happen with any of those three entities. Now, tree and bud and bronchovascular nodular interstitial patterns look very similar at first glance. The image on the left is a tree and bud case. So the image on the right is a um, bronchovascular case. Um, they share a lot of appearances. How do you tell the two apart? Um, well, you can tell the two apart looking at um, other ancillary findings. So um, tree and bud pattern is um, secondary to small airways infection. And so it's not unusual to therefore expect to see some airway disease besides just the dots. Um, do you see bronchial wall thickening um, in the area? Um, you might even see a few little subsegmental uh, mucus plugs too. Uh, you might notice uh, suggestions that there's air trapping. Um, areas of the involved lung look a little blacker than the non-involved areas. And um, you'll notice that the pulmonary arteries should be pretty smooth, right? There's no periarterial lymphatic involvement here, so nothing to mimic the look of little dots studying your pulmonary arteries. On the other hand, if you're dealing with bronchial vascular process like sarcoid or, pneumoc or pneumoconiosis or what have you, um, the airways generally are gonna look healthier than in the case of tree and bud. And because uh, there's a chance that some of this is involved in the periarterial lymphatics, if you look carefully, you might see little dots uh, studying the pulmonary arteries, representing little clumps within the periarterial lymphatic paralleling your pulmonary artery. So that's how I'll do my best to distinguish the two from each other. But it requires a little extra time staring at those images. Finally, um, as we talked about the random pattern. Um, people sometimes discuss the miliary pattern too. Um, some may say that the miliary pattern is just a little bit more discreet than a random pattern. But at the end of the day, the actual distribution of dots is identical and the differential diagnosis is also identical. Um, so unlike the case where tree and bud look different than central lobular, 
or say um, broncovascular looks different than paralymphatic. Um, Miller and random to me from an imaging perspective, uh, in terms of the you know the main kind of uh, characteristics, they look the same to me. And so um, you know there's not much to be added about um, uh, bringing in a, a yet another term here. So there you have it. Um, we've kind of gone through um, a discussion of all the terms um, folks will use when describing nodular interstitial patterns. Uh, we kind of discouraged you from using the terms in that first column when describing nodular interstitial patterns. Try to use those more for masses of consolidation. Uh, we capped, recapped how basically miliary pattern is a pattern you hope people describe, but really doesn't add much value as a sixth um, pattern to worry about. So in the end, there's really only five nodular interstitial patterns that we ask you to be able to recognize on a CT image. Five um, patterns with different um, characteristics. I'm going to gray out um, two of those boxes just because uh, yes or no and any possible uh, geographic distribution uh, aren't very helpful from a from being specific standpoint. So we're going to gray out those two cells and then discuss how do we use these rules to approach um, the decision making of whether you're dealing with a central lobular or a random or whatever pattern? Well, for me, um, I usually start by ruling in or ruling out a central lobular pattern. Um, if I think I'm seeing a pattern of micronodular dots on my CT image, I first ask myself, are these faint fuzzy dots oftentimes so faint I can barely see them and wonder if I'm really seeing a pattern at all? Um, if so, um, I'm going to lean heavily on calling this a central lobular pattern. If not, it's probably one of the other four. If it's one of the other four, the next two most easy patterns to rule in or rule out are going to be a paralymphatic or a random pattern. I'm going to look for plural studying um, along the margins of the lung or along the fissure. And if I see it, it's a paralymphatic pattern. I'm going to also look for it. Is the distribution just relatively uniform everywhere? Um, starry sky kind of look um, at night. If so, I'm going to lean heavily on calling this a random nodular interstitial pattern. If it's neither, then what I'm looking at is what remains, either a bronchovascular or a tree and bud pattern. And I'm going to start looking for features that suggest I'm heading towards an airway versus a lymphatic diagnosis. Do I see a lot of mucus plugging, really thickened bronchial walls? Do I see pulmonary artery studying? And that will help me go one way or the other. Now, there are going to be times where I cannot make that call. I'm still not sure. The imaging is too noisy to, to discern. Well, in those cases, we have to understand our limits. And instead of trying to force ourselves into making a false decision, we just, there's when there's not enough um, information on the image, we may just have to say, this thing could be bronchovascular or a tree and bud, and unfortunately have to give a broader differential. So that's our, the discussion on nodular um, interstitial patterns, um, non-calcified nodular interstitial patterns. Um, we're just going to spend a few minutes now talking about part calcified nodular um, interstitial patterns, um, a much shorter conversation. In these um, um, situations, um, you're going to witness that not all the nodular interstitial dots are soft tissue density. Some of them will look white, um, higher in attenuation. You'll also kind of realize that it's a less commonly encountered pattern compared to non-calcified nodular interstitial pattern, and that the differential diagnoses um, are a little bit more um, unusual and also a little bit shorter. This is the, non this is the uh, differential diagnosis um, that I usually kind of think about when I talk about part calcified nodular interstitial patterns, uh, going from common to rare. And uh, the first three, th three things we've kind of put in, yellow, uh, in orange here, um, these are the things that you may see in real life. And so I'd remember the top three, silicosis, remote infection, and disseminated pulmonary ossification, DPO. Um, the things lower on the chart can cause a part calcified or almost totally calcified nodular interstitial pattern, but they're very rare. And the only place I think I've encountered these guys has primarily been on exams, rather on you know as in tests, um, like the boards, as opposed to kind of real life. 
So let's spend most of the time talking about these top three answers that are actually common diagnoses. I'm starting with silicosis. Um, people estimate that usually um, in silicosis cases, up to 10% of the dots might calcify. And so you might see this example like this. There's a lot going on besides just the nodular interstitial pattern. It looks like we got some consolidation or fibrosis going on in the right lung here, but kind of ignore that for the purposes of my conversation. Uh, try to focus on that left lung. Um, and you'll notice um, that if you go to a soft tissue or a bone window, some of those dots look white. This is a part calcified nodular interstitial pattern at play. Um, remote infections. Uh, remote infections can also um, result in a part calcified nodular interstitial pattern. And there's two diseases that we want to think about. Uh, histoplasmosis and varicella. Um, these um, could result in a nodular calcified interstitial pattern in, in some folks. Um, one way to distinguish between the two, um, if you're entertaining this um, kind of um, diagnosis group here, is to look at the lymph nodes. Um, generally speaking, we're going to see calcification uh, within the mediastinal lymph nodes in histoplasmosis cases, but not varicella cases. And here's an example of a part calcified nodular interstitial pattern in the setting of remote histo. Um, we start talking about the less common things on that list, um, just so that we've shown you the examples. Um, pulmonary hemosiderosis is a potential, more uncommon cause of a part calcified nodular um, interstitial pattern, where chronic CHF is posited to, to cause tiny little pulmonary hemorrhages, which lead to calcification and tiny little dots. Um, an entity called metastatic calcification, where um, we're depositing calcium due to abnormal metabolism, basically, uh, in the body. Uh, we're depositing that in the lung. Um, that could cause a part calcified uh, nodular interstitial pattern. Um, sometimes um, you may get a look like this, and it could get really, really confluent um, with more severe deposition. Uh, disease of uh, pulmonary alveolar mycolithiasis is another one. Again, these are very, very unusual diagnoses that you're more likely to encounter in a board setting than not in the real world. So there you have it. Uh, we've gone through now a review of basically um, how to approach um, nodular um, interstitial opacities, both the non-calcified and the part-calcified ones.